Welcome everyone to another VITA Learning Webinar. I hope things are well for everyone. Uh, today we have um, Paul Carolitis. Uh, hi Paul, how are you doing? Hello. Uh, Paul's gonna talk about something that we really don't talk a lot about, our partial dentures and setting them up, how to design, how to make them work uh, for the patient, uh, the best practices of today and so forth. So looking forward, Paul, to see your, your presentation. Uh, we're going to go over two selection and design considerations for the Kennedy Class 4 Partially Edentulous Patient is our theme today. Uh, before we get into the presentation, I would like to do some uh, housekeeping uh, items. Everyone, your phone is on mute. So if you have a question, which we'll have a, a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, on that panel on the right hand side of your screen go ahead and uh, bring out that uh, question box type in your question send it through we'll save it to the end and then we'll uh, ask your question uh, so that's going to be held at the end we will also be recording this webinar so those of you who are attending if you feel you need to you can always go back to our vita north america youtube channel and give us a couple of days, but this webinar will be posted. You'll also see on that channel additional webinars that we've done in the past, plus some product videos and so forth, how to use uh, Vita materials as well. Uh, so that'll be posted. Your CE, those of you who are gonna ask the question, the CE will be uh, through automatic, so we'll use the registration information that you provided us for this webinar, and we will send you an email uh, about the CE, and if you need a certificate, a letter, or through NBC credit. So, so today, uh, Paul Carolitis, two selection and design consideration for the Kennedy Class 4 partially edentulous patient. Uh, Paul is a graduate of George Brown College in both denture, denturism and dental technology programs, which, which is nice. We do these webinars for the U.S. and for Canada. Obviously, the U.S. Um, has more technicians than denturists because of the laws that we have depending on the state by state, but this is great to have someone like Paul on that has seen both sides, work with both sides, work with the patient, but also um, does some technical um, aspects as well from a technician standpoint. Uh, Paul holds a bachelor's degree in, uh, what is it, gerontology? gerontology? Did I pronounce that right? Gerontology, gerontology. So, so is that for the uh, elderly? Correct. Yeah, so from uh, Laurentian University. Laurentian U, yep. All right, so um, that was a 40, four year degree? Uh, three. Nothing, did that also have to do with uh, dental as uh, well? We tied it in in the practicum. In yeah, the practicum, okay. Of course, the program, we go to some long term care facilities and uh, see clients there. All right, so, nice, it nice. Does have some overlap, obviously. Yeah, I was gonna say they at least they they kind of coincide and work together. Yes. Uh, Paul has owned and operated his own denture clinic and dental laboratory for over 25 years. Currently, Paul is a, is a full-time professor at George Brown College. His passion for education and removable prosthodontics had led him to a journey to lecture and educate future denturists and dental technicians in Canada and the U.S. as well as Great Britain. Paul was an educator for the International Denturist Education Program, which he was responsible for uh, launching denturism as a recognized profession uh, in many countries. So I uh, hope you're helping the U.S. Uh, develop those two state by state. That was included. It would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, currently, Paul is an elected member of the Council to the College of Denturists of Ontario, uh, building efficiency in laboratory and clinical skill results in increased satisfaction for both you and your clients. So welcome, Paul. I will create and make you the presenter at this time. 
And I want to thank you for helping us out doing this uh, program today. You are now the presenter. Okay, everybody got me there? How we doing? And I see your screen. And if you just go into the show mode, we should be good. How we doing? Okay. Here we go. Yep, we're all there. So I'm going to put myself on mute, and we will see you on the back end. All okay, right. great stuff, Jim. Any tech problems, just come back in. I think we're okay now. I think we're okay. You got it. Okay, welcome, everybody. Big hello from myself, Paul, to my friends, my dental technology friends, and my denturism friends out there. Um, if you don't know me, uh, my hometown is Georgetown, Ontario. And as uh, Jim had mentioned earlier, I'm a uh, graduate of George Brown College and the dental technology program. And then a good 10 years later, came back for more punishment and graduated from the denturism program. Also, big hello out there to my Francophone friends in Quebec. Uh, unfortunately, my, uh, my uh, uh, French is limited, so you're going to get me in English today. Uh, that would be real challenging. Um, and also uh, my good dental technology friends in the U.S. Um, uh, the goals of today, I wanted to choose something that we could take away would be useful. So today I want to discuss the Kennedy class uh, for design choices. Also discuss some large anterior class four designs. And then I have a case presentation, which was just uh, recent. Try to stay current. So uh, a big thanks to uh, Jim for inviting me here uh, today to speak to you guys. It's exciting uh, for me. Hopefully I'll try to make it exciting for you in the short time we have, as well as a big uh, thanks to Denise here in uh, Canada and our local reps, uh, Brandon and Sean, who are uh, uh, very present um, all the time. So uh, this is our goal for today. We're gonna go through these let's say three subjects. I might break out to a little camera session and go over some drawings, but we're gonna go back to school a little bit. So I apologize for that if it becomes uh, remedial or redundant, but uh, I attend many of the Vita uh, seminars uh, with Mark and Peter and who's been on else and, um, and Paul, as well as there's always something to take away. Um, so uh, if, if it becomes a little bit on the soft side, uh, you know, you can tune me out for a few minutes, but then come back in. There will always be something. Uh, I know as, a, as an attendee to presentations myself, there's always something there uh, for everyone at some time. So um, what I wanted to talk about today is this particular right in front of us here. And uh, for those of us who go back to school, the Kennedy Class 4, is the anterior modification uh, crossing the midline. So between canine and canine is what we're trying to restore here. Uh, and naturally implant treatment is a viable option, but many times I see these clients in the clinic or I see these cases in the laboratory, which I'll show you a few today, um, that come in with the transitional partial denture uh, for 10 years, 12 years, maybe a cast partial denture, maybe a broken down one, or maybe they've just had recent extractions. So uh, when something happens in the anterior section of the patient, then this is really an impetus for them to go for some treatment to the dentist. Sometimes when something's missing in the back, they just forego it and go without. But when something happens up at the front, uh, they're a little bit more apt to go ahead and uh, get something here for the anterior section. So when we look at this, even this picture, the simple one I have on the screen, um, right away i'm sure a lot of dental technicians and dentures you have a design in mind already what we're going to do but where do the designs come from we got to have some ideas we got to get some choices as a dental technician though we we're kind of more privy to a lot of dental offices and a lot of colleagues in our office unfortunate though for the denturist i'm one as well we work in a lot of isolation so we might have a friend or a colleague or a schoolmate we might call and say listen i have this case and you know, you've all been to the trade show where you go through that conversation. It's like, oh, I've had this case. And then I'm like, I don't want to talk about cases. I just want to like relax. <laughs> I want a weekend away. But still, as the dentures, we work in isolation. Where did we get our ideas? Where did we get our choices? We go back to school. This is a textbook that we've currently used here at uh, George Brown College. 
um, where I think at the beginning, Jim said I was a, I'm an instructor here at George Brown College. Um, I didn't, I, I'm sure he also mentioned I work in private practice. I've sold my private practice as of late a few years ago and now currently work in a dental office, uh, kind of like on the quiet way out, so to speak. But it's been a long journey going on 40 years. Uh, but this textbook is one we've used currently at George Brown from University of Southern California. Uh, we've got this one here from our own Dr. Zarb here at the University of Toronto, prosthodontic treatment for the edentulous patient. So we go through these textbooks and revisit them. The irony of some of them, though, if I even go back to the first one, it says partial denture design. Crack this textbook. There's probably only two pages dedicated to design. The rest is basic information. They'll start off with Kennedy class, major connector, minor connectors, clasp designs, and maybe some definitions. But the design feature I always find is empty. So we have this book from Zarb. I think this is Stewart's Clinical Removal Partial Prosthodontics. We have Davenport's Color Atlas. I've used this in the Denturism program. I've used photos from this on the international program, Jim was mentioning, some courses for uh, the United States, um, as well as uh, overseas, when that distance education program seemed to be a little bit more popular. And now they have their own programs going on overseas and in the US as well. Uh, obviously not in every state. Um, I believe it's just in the West Coast, but uh, correct me later if I'm wrong, I apologize. Uh, what's going on in each state, I can't keep up. But this uh, Davenport's textbook was very good. Uh, the Color Atlas, we've got uh, Bago's uh, design book. Um, uh, we've got the Quintessence books of removal partial denture design. Again, not much design in this textbook. Uh, we got Marxers again from Bago. And um, years ago on eBay, my pen works. I bought this on eBay for a total of $8. Came from California. It was in good shape. I still have it here today. I show some of the students this at the beginning of our program. And there is some information here, obviously, that is still, uh, is still useful today. Nothing's really changed. This book was published 1928. So we're going on almost 100 years of, uh, of Edward Kennedy's uh, first parcel denture design construction book. Uh, that was a good $8 investment. And then we can't believe the great shape that book was in. And then once we're finished our textbook, okay, a little bit of goofiness, we might take our local magazine to the back office and uh, do some reading, try to maximize our time. <laughs> so it's a little bit silly. Uh, and we'll try to come up with some vision for a design. Uh, through our textbooks, through our colleagues, through the back office readings of our latest magazines. And then we come back to the bench. And this is another silly picture. Way back in the early days, uh, one of the techs was polishing, going hard at some night guards. I said, give me those glasses. What can you see? A big racing strike down the side. But when we uh, can't get the right answer, we go back to the back office, maybe with a new magazine, but some days are just the same. Okay, silly, silly pictures. But uh, let's get down to it here. So I'll go back to another model, just a stock model, um, kind of a prefabricated. But this is our Kennedy uh, class four model. So right away, we're going to look at this. And like I said, dental technicians, especially chrome dental technicians, right away, boom, you're going to go to a design. So I always ask myself and ask others, I said, what comes first? The design comes in our head or does the design come by looking at the model? And I find that in early days in dental technology, we would become, let's say, really cavalier and treat all cases the same. And that is a kind of a dangerous thing to do is to categorize all Kennedy class fours and treat them all the same way. And today I'm hoping that's our takeaway is some things to think about. I'm not here to tell you what to do, I'm just here to illuminate some things to think about in the next time we cross one of these. And I'll show you one that I've crossed recently and some others. So we have this Kennedy class four. The first thing you should do, even though you may have an idea up here, what you, what you wanna proceed with, now naturally there's a lot of questions right away. Does the patient have an existing uh, appliance? If they do, what is it? Did they have a bridge work? Did, was it recently lost? What's the opposing dentition? Is it a natural dentition? What's the classification of occlusion? Is it class one, two, three, end to end? 
the opposing a full denture, partial denture, implants, the amount of overbite if it's a class one. There's so many considerations. The health of the clinical dentition left over uh, or the clinical crowds or um, the health of the tissue. So these things all have to be culminated together to come up with a treatment plan. Now, dental technicians, you know what I'm talking about. The dentist these days, and I apologize for any dentist listening, but I wanna speak really clearly and frankly, that this gets downloaded to the laboratory many times. Like here's the model, uh, make uh, PUD or CPUD, you might get cast partial upper denture. And now we need to go and venture into our own ideas because uh, the practitioner didn't give us any ideas to go on to. And they said, well, you're a technician, you should know what to do. So we're gonna have to revisit the surveyor. This is maybe school time. Uh, instead of the visual surveyor, uh, surveyor with our parallel hand, and then we're gonna use some of these instruments. It looks complicated, it's very simple. We have our three undercut gauges of 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75. I think I got AR for our analyzing rod and a lead holder and a scalpel. We're going to do some wax ups or maybe some diagnostic uh, reductions on some teeth. So we should use the surveyor not to tell us what design to use, but maybe to justify the design that we have in our mind already. Now, when we look at that case, I know 90% of us are gonna say, uh, well, embrasure clasp on five and six and some type of uh, anterior rest on the canines, whether that be a mesiolingual rest, a singular rest, or an apron rest on the canines, and a horseshoe major connector. I mean, that would be 90% of the design. But sometimes, and I've experienced this, that by nature, the Kennedy class four is a tooth-borne partial, tooth-supported partial denture, and there should be no rotations that exist with the Kennedy class four, although sometimes it does. And today I wanna to talk about when those times are or when it happens, because you'd hate to finish the case and the dentist comes, uh, the patient goes to the dentist or the patient comes back to us as the dentures and says, you know, I'm getting a lot of anterior movement here on my denture, it seems to be dropping down a lot. And we know from uh, that mobility in prosthetics, it's not good. mobility is going to increase atrophy, mobility is gonna increase, increase sore spots, Mobility is going to increase our headaches as a technician in the remake department or as a denturist, our headaches in the adjustments. And then if I can quote uh, Mark, I think a few lectures back, talked about, sorry, Mark, I hope you're on and listening, but I like you always talk about the uh, burnout of denturists and the rate and, and this kind of adjustment headaches. And I've seen a lot of denturists leaving the profession. Uh, for whatever reason, they seek other opportunities and they're not leaving it after one year. They're leaving after 10, 12, 13 years saying, I think I have time to go do something else. And I'm not saying the Kennedy class four was the reason for them doing such a thing, but this definitely was part and parcel of the whole package of burnout, working in isolation, and having patients that are unhappy with the expectation of the, of the prosthetic that they were going to receive. So these undercut gauges, I'm going to go straight to the model. I'll put the model on the uh, base. There was a few textbooks at the beginning I forgot to mention. When I was a student, we had the U.S. Air Force manual, which I still think is prevalent today. Uh, we had uh, Mosby's partial denture textbook, volume two. And we would, uh, and they're ex excellent, excellent resources. But we would set our master model on the uh, surveying table at a set zero position and at least start there and try to analyze the undercuts to justify the design that I have in my mind. So I'm analyzing the four, I'm looking at the five, this is the one five, I'm looking at the six, I'm looking at the distal of the one six, if I'm thinking of that embrasure class that I uh, kind of had in my mind already. Uh, I'm gonna look at the one seven at the distal side, I'm gonna look at the type of teeth they are, are they crowns? Are they uh, composite buildups? Is there a lot of root exposure? I'm going to look, as a technician, I'm going to look at the dentist prescription number one. I'm going to look at the tissue where their old major connector was, see if that gives me some uh, kind of hints at which direction to go. And today, when I go to a little camera breakout, maybe I'll go through the four procedures of designing a partial denture 
which will apply to all edentulous or partially edentulous situations. If you follow these four steps that I think I made up when someone asked me, they said, well, what do you do first? And I said, well, I do this. I never really thought of what I did. I just did it. And then uh, verbalizing it, I came up with four steps to partial denture design, which I think would apply to all candidate classifications. So I'm surveying or analyzing still. Uh, I'm going to do the other side, obviously. Uh, I'm going to do two, four, five, two, six, two, seven. But keep in mind now, the patient didn't go see the dentist or didn't come to see us, the denturist because they wanted clasps on their teeth or they wanted metal on their palate. They didn't lose their palate. They lost their four front teeth. So now this is a highly aesthetic zone for the client. Uh, I'm looking at the guide plane of the mesial of the canine one three here to see if we can or possibly reduce to minimize or reduce the guide plane to minimize this interproximal space, whether through the path of insertion or through some clinical alterations, that if this is a diagnostic model, let's say, from the dentist or a diagnostic model for ourselves, the denturist. I'm sorry, I keep going back and forth. I'm trying to give both sides of the story and it's, it's very similar. Uh, but we should have a look at this guide plane to see if we can minimize this uh, interproximal gap, so to speak. That's going to be pretty unsightly for the client, a mesial of 1, 3, and 2, 3. If this is a diagnostic model, again, looking at the soft tissue undercut in the anterior, which could change my path of insertion. A lot of clients have some, maybe some mobile tissue here. Maybe they have a lot of big bony protuberance. Maybe there's a huge undercut in the anterior section, which is going to design your flange. So if you have an acrylic flange designed here, maybe we'll shorten the flange. Maybe we'll lengthen the flange. The uh, patient obviously wants some lip support back. I mean, we can't actually do the Botox treatment with the partial denture, but we can kind of help them a bit if they've lost some uh, labial lip support. But for the path of insertion and dislodgement of the partial denture, we need to analyze the soft tissue undercut. And maybe we're going to go gum fit with these four teeth. Maybe there'll be no flange and they'll just be all, let's say, uh, tooth and tooth acrylic or composite in the anterior section. Uh, one thing we don't have here as the technician is the smile line. Hopefully from an occlusal record or a bite block or occlusal rim, we'll see that smile line, which is gonna help us in tooth selection for length and obviously setup as well. So this is, um, you know, I worked in the laboratory in the early days. And I gotta be honest, some of these things are just, one day was just the next, just, okay, to embrace your class, just make it, let someone else trim the, uh, the mesh and the posts and the, the dentist can adjust the path of insertion. The patient can, I'm sure they suffered slightly, if not a lot with the denture sores in the anterior edentulous space. Um, but if, again, if this is a diagnostic model, you wouldn't do this on the final version, of course, people, but on a diagnostic model, I could use my surveyor and scalpel uh, tool in my surveyor to reduce the guide surfaces on the mesial of one, three, and two, three. Now, marking to the dentist, listen, if you want this case to be more aesthetically pleasing, reduce these two surfaces right here, if that's possible. I mean, we're, we're, this is a tooth structure here. We're, we have no idea, that, you know, if we're into the dentin already. There is a limitation of how much tooth structure we can reduce, but possibly uh, we have to look at that. So these, again, today, I'm trying to take away some ideas to kind of give us things more things to think about. And now, like when I'm approaching 30 some odd years, I don't even want to think how many years, and someone asked me, so when you have this, what do you do? I find more often than not, my answer is depends. I don't have an answer. Well, it depends. It depends on too many things. Before in my early days, I said, yeah, yeah, you just do this and do that, and it's done. But now as we get older, we're more into our profession, vested interest in our clients and in our dental office clients, uh, it depends. There's a lot of things that depend. Uh, soft tissue undercuts, guide surfaces, clinical crowns. Uh, we didn't even talk about the opposing bite yet, but here I'm just going through some uh, photos on a stock model that I would use for education purposes, but also when I look at it, it reminds me of the case I did two weeks ago. Maybe I shouldn't have been so hastily and looked at this myself. I'll show you that case uh, coming up a little bit later. 
So here we're just showing some, um, now the patient, the dentist can't take the surveyor in the patient's mouth, but obviously they can follow your lead here with these, uh, you know, Actun uh, red hash marks on the canines of where the reduction you think would be more advantageous to maximize the, uh, the aesthetics uh, for this client. So I'm going back to the posterior now. Uh, I'm still on part one. Don't get lost with me now. We're still on part one talking about ideas for Kennedy class four anterior modification only. Um, and here you see my survey lines. Well, this stock model obviously is developing undercuts at this uh, uh, angle on the surveying table. Uh, I could use the four, the five, the six, or the seven in any direction I choose. So I think it's easier for dentists if they're going to do interproximal preparations or if they need to do some rest preparations on the distal of five, on the mesial of six, it's easier for them to get their handpiece interproximally and let's say open up the marginal ridge between five and six. Hopefully, I remember in some early days, the dentist would just prep the rests, but not the marginal ridge. So it's great, the rests are not in occlusion, but the minor connector going for the retentive arm from the lingual minor connector to the buckle, then that's in the occlusion. And we're not going to make chrome, open the bite with the chrome interproximal uh, embrasure clasp. And then, you know, the dentist would reduce the embrasure clasp, and then you know what happens, dental technicians and dentures, that patient shows up broken clasp. <laughs> and say, you're saying, well, why did it break? Many reasons. One of them could be the reduction or the lack of reduction for the embrasure class for interclusal space. So here are my survey lines. I'm going to go ahead and survey lines on the other side of the second quadrant, uh, survey line on the soft tissue. And this would be my first step now. I've got my survey lines. I could class four, five, six, and seven. I've seen some textbook come through the anterior with some eye bars or roach clasps on the canines, that's unsightly, I think, uh, but really reserved for the extreme um, uh, case that you want to minimize the rotation. But the first step I'm going to do is outline the dentulous area. The patient came for the four teeth in the anterior, the centrals and the laterals. I'm going to outline my internal finishing line, hopefully with a sharp pencil, unlike I did here with a with a uh, adult pencil. But I've uh, kept the incisive papilla in the acrylic portion saddle of the anterior space. That needs to be uh, maybe possibly relieved. Uh, maybe it's mobile, but we're giving that more space. Uh, try not to sit on it with the chrome frame. But you see my, uh, uh, my internal finishing line. And then at this moment, I decide, am I gonna, how am I gonna attach the four prosthetic teeth to this parcel? Am I gonna attach it with the mesh? lattice structure? Am I going to attach it with some posts? Am I going to attach it with both of that? Is there a deep overbite where I may need some metal lingual backings? There's no room. The patient's lower anterior teeth are occluding with the maxillary palate. And we've seen that many, many times. So now do we need some reduction of the opposing? Do we need to do metal backings in the anterior? If we're going to do metal backings in the anterior, do we need a diagnostic setup? so we could get the chrome in the right location for the lingual, the anterior. So that's a mouthful of a lot of stuff and a lot of picture. But again, there's no more than that. I'm just gonna go over it again. But the first thing I do is outline the edentulous area. And then I've taken my 0.25 undercut gauge, which every surveyor comes with one. Um, and I think for most chromium cobalt clasps, 0.25 would be, 90% of all the clasps that you would use to engage below the height of contour. So I've used the 0.25 millimeter undercut gauge at the distal here of 1.6. And I apologize for the notation. I forgot the uh, Americans would call this tooth number three, two, three. Sorry for the universal uh, tooth number. Uh, we're kind of really uh, always assume we become uh, ethnocentric here in the north of the border that we just use the same tooth number of systems. So I apologize, but you can see the two things here. One six distal buckle or the first molar upper first quadrant uh, distal buckle, 0.25 millimeter undercut. And I've marked the terminal end of the class with the red pencil. 
Now, before you're out there rolling your eyes, okay, I can't see, you, but I know some of you might be doing this, but you're like, oh, who does that? Who takes the surveyor and who surveys the team? That's the chrome guy. Well, in this situation, I'm the chrome guy. I'm the dental technician, I'm the denturist, and I know it's hard to believe, but I would make my own chrome frames and I'm thinking we can take that away from us today too. It's not a big deal to control this in your own office. You don't need a big outlay of equipment, maybe a vacuum mixer, which most dentists might have if you're vacuum mixing your final models to avoid these nice little bubbles that I have on, on my model here. Maybe you have a vacuum mixer already. That's all you would need and some investment, some patterns. You can invest it yourself and send it to your local laboratory. They can cast it and come back. You can trim it. Some dentures say, well, why would I want to do all that work? Once you go through any procedure, it might seem onerous at first, but it's really quick. Uh, 15 minutes wax up, 15 minutes to trim it, and you've surveyed it. So the clasps are, should be in the right location, easy to adjust. We send this to the Chrome Laboratory. I'm sorry, Chrome Laboratory technicians, if you're out there. But you know what? We are limited in the Chrome departments at a hundred and some odd dollars a frame. What a beautiful service that is that they're providing. But you know, a lot of those frames get overworked. Maybe there's some secondary alloys put into that uh, Chrome framework, meaning like the sprues and the buttons to save, you know, uh, make it cost effective. And then these clasps get adjusted with the clasps, uh, with the wire benders a lot. And then they're more, be more prone to fracture. So Denturis, every time I talk to my Denturis friends, and they say, oh, which laboratory are you? I said, well, I used to use this one. I used to use that one. And now I use my own. They said, well, why do you use your own? I said, well, I only do a few. I don't have many partial dentures. And it's not a lot of work. And then I can control it better. And then I got no one to complain to and working by myself anyways. So uh, a law, I digress, sorry, about the Chrome. But survey the model. It's 30 seconds outlining the depth of the undercut for the embrasure clasp on the first molar, three seconds. And then I'll freehand it with my, with my handy dandy pencil here. Whether I'm sending this to the Chrome Laboratory, don't send it to the Chrome Laboratory naked model. You should put something on there, giving them direction. So if the dentist didn't give us directions, technicians, we should give the Chrome laboratory some directions of what we're expecting. And if we can't do that, then we need to seek out some other avenues. Maybe we go back to the beginning of this presentation for some choices of ideas. Maybe you, some of you here can take away something today. It would be fantastic. So outline with the red pencil on the six. I did the same here on the one five, 0.25 millimeters. And now here is a maybe next level partial dentures, maybe not for some of us, but I've marked my embrasure clasp here, 0.25 millimeters on the one five and on the six second bicuspid first one. And now you might say, what is he doing? I'm measuring the throw of the clasp, meaning this, I mean, we're all successfully making prosthetics out there. I'm digress again. We're making successful prosthetics already. But how can we now differentiate us from ourselves, how we were yesterday? How can we differentiate us from our clients, our, our competition? What can I do? Maybe the next step, something, can I, is there something better? I know when I finish a case and I've told other people this, they say, so how'd it go? The one I'll show you today can be better. After you're done, it's like, oh, if I was to do it again, I would do this and this. There's always something that you could do different. And sometimes having that uh, experience beforehand would help, and we are gaining that as we practice. But uh, we're bound by time constraints always. Well, that was the time I had for the kids. She needed it in two weeks. She was going to Florida on vacation for the winter. I had two weeks to finish it, and I, I did the best I could, uh, which was above average in industry, let's say. But still, when we finish the case, what we can do next? So back to this slide. And maybe some things to think about, maybe not things to do, that this retentive arm is traveling 2.05 millimeters below the height of contour. So it is in contact with the tooth at the path of dislodgement for 2.05 millimeters. Now, that makes me think of the other side of the tooth, that the reciprocal arm, it would be nice if the reciprocal arm is engaging the tooth 
for 2.05 millimeters of time or length. So therefore, when the clasp is dislodged from the uh, direct retainer or the molar, when the clasp is dislodged, that we have contact reciprocating the action force of the embrasure clasp, the retentive arm of the embrasure clasp or Bonwell's clasp or double acres clasp, whatever you would, double E clasp, whatever you want to call that clasp, the double acres embrasure clasp. Uh, every part of the geography of North America and around the world, they call something different. But the reciprocal arm now should contact the tooth for 2.05 millimeters of time. It'd be great. And you see on the bicuspid, I just put a blue line where I would notice, put my reciprocal arm above the height of contour. It's not retentive. Anywhere there is fine. So the molar might be now, give me the thickness with your blue pencil. Give me the thickness of my reciprocal arm. Maybe if I can ask for a reduction of the reciprocal arm of the molar. If we go next steps, let's say we cross the pond in the center of Europe where you know dentistry was covered at one time, they would always crown the, uh, the uh, direct retainers or they would crown the abutment teeth. So therefore, we're going to create ledges, and they would create a ledge in the PFM, or gold crown, whatever it was, and how much of a ledge would they create? 2.05 millimeters. Now, I worked in the crown and bridge department for many years in the earlier days, and I made many ledges on molars, and I think the ledge width was probably the width of my number seven spatula. So I apologize to those clients 35 years ago, but still, we adjusted for the retentive arm location afterwards. But the ledge now, now the dental technician or the denturist is now venturing into fixed prosthetics. We have to, we can't ignore it. We can't ignore uh, a dentistry. We can't compartmentalize it. You know, dentures encompasses implants, encompasses uh, PFMs, encompasses uh, reductions of, of tooth, it encompasses obviously tissue management. So. This now, you wouldn't go most likely and prepare a 2.05 millimeter ledge in a natural tooth. You'd be run out of enamel and it would be pretty evasive. But I'm just showing this as an example that if you are going to make a PFM for your abutment, then you need to get involved in the design concept of the PFM. So if that denturist is working in conjunction with the dentist, working in conjunction with the laboratory, then communication amongst the team needs to be a bit better, I think, to get a better result. And here I've measured a reciprocal arm, reduced or not reduced. So now I got more of a reciprocal band or a reciprocal strap, a thicker a reciprocal clasp at 2.05. So when this partial is disengaged, then there is contact on the reciprocal side or the non-active side. So when this clasp dislodges, that this tooth microscopically, depending on the ligaments, are not getting stretched every time this denture goes in and out, in and out, in and out. I mean, this... This over time is going to compromise the abutment tooth. And I think we all know this now that obviously long-term prosthetics or partial denture prosthetics, they're not the best for the clinical crowns and the tissue in the patient's mouth, but it is the better of, let's say, two evils. Like we're not going to get implants, too much of any dental space for long span bridge work. So now we got to go into the removal of prostho. And now we got to start sitting on teeth, tooth borne. This partial denture is tooth born in nature, meaning tooth supported, meaning there should be no rotations under function. There should be academically, even if we go back to 1928, Edward Kennedy's book, no rotations in uh, Kennedy class four. But now sometimes it exists. And I'm here today saying, this happened to me. And here's why. And here's some things to think about the next time you venture and make now, I know a lot of dental technicians and a lot of dentures, you look at a case, it comes in, oh, that's straightforward, that's easy, boom, 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 it's done. And then it comes back, it comes back for adjustments or it comes back for a remake or it comes back for something more, uh, a bigger adjustment or it comes back with a complaint to the lab or the clinic. And then the cases that look really, let's say, compromised or difficult, those ones seem to go smoother. You know, and you wish you had that foresight at the beginning. 
So these simple, straightforward Kennedy class four, four anterior teeth cases, they're not the easiest cases. We're dealing with the aesthetic zone. We're dealing sometimes with some rotation. If you want to minimize palate design, we've got this horseshoe that I'm designing here. This model, yes, this is from Thursday. What's today? Tuesday. That's four business days ago. This came in for a custom tray. So back to Jim's uh, introduction. I still do laboratory work for a small select dental offices, as well as my own as a denturist. I think it's important to be in industry, especially if you're educating. Uh, I think it's very important to become believable and that I'm living what I'm teaching. It's not like, oh, I did it 25 years ago and I heard it's done this way. Actually, this is four days ago. This is for a custom tray. You can see the impression is short here in the palette. And there's some bubbles. But this model, you can see the ledge on the first molar here. You see the P you see the crown made by the very capable dental technician, gold crown, PFM crown, I can't tell, but the nice anatomy. And you see the ledge. I also see the tissue of what okay, it's easy to be a critic, right? But I can see the tissue demarcation of the old partial. So um, that might not be a correct major connector design, which I want to talk about. And look at the other side, it has another ledge. The weird thing is, the, oh, do I have, is this you see in this picture? The ledges are different heights on both sides. This was four days ago. And this is something I want to talk I said, oh, I'm going to talk about that on Tuesday. I should bring this one. I just snapped one on the lab bench there. So the ledge on one side is like 1.5 millimeters, and the other one is the whole lingual side of the tooth. The anatomy looks good. The rest preparation is good. Rest prep is nice and wide, or rest that's incorporated into the crown is wide and shallow, it's not rigid. But we're going to talk about this design shortly. So here's my uh, whatever I've chosen to do with the clasp. I've got my embrasure clasp five and six on both sides. Outlined in here. Here's my horseshoe major connector. And on the anterior side of the canines, I have some cingulum rests, some mesiolingual rests should have aprons if the bite is deep, let's say. But I need something there. You can't keep something void off the canines to close off this uh, proximal guide plate surface. And we should have guide plates. I see many frameworks come from some laboratories that are missing guide plates. It's like, why wouldn't they put the metal guide plate? Well, it's easier to make it fit without, but still there should be one. And we should demand one, or if we're making it ourselves, we should. So well, here's a summary of considerations for the class four. Where are the undercuts? Tell us which teeth to use or direct retainers. Do we need some guide plane reductions to improve this aesthetics in the anterior? Where is the soft tissue undercut so I can design what kind of flange I would like or have? Where is the reciprocal clasp design going to be? Is it going to be on and above the height of contour? Can I keep lower to the height of contour? Can I make it a little bit wider? The major connector design. Is it going to be a horseshoe? Is the depth of the vault of the palate is very important here. The depth of the palate. I think there might be some classifications of vaults of the palate. One, two, three. I think three being very deep. This is very important because this major connector should be congruent or parallel to the plane of occlusion. We can't have the major connector up on an inclined plane. Um, the opposing uh, dentition, where was it? Oh, occlusal classification. Is it class one, two, or three? Uh, is there overbite? Is it a class two, diff two? We have a lot of uh, classification to consider here in the occlusion. The opposing dentition, is it full denture, bridge work, implants, crowns, another partial? Maybe nothing, maybe something in the future. Be nice if they make them at the same time. I see many dentists and even some offices the same. Well, we're doing the upper now, whether it's insurance reasons or compliance reasons. We're going to do the lower later, or I just want the lower for now. Well, it's nice if they're engineered together. Okay. So if someone has a 20-year-old worn dentition, I'm going to create a 20-year-old worn opposing. So the clinical health of the abutments is important. Can we clasp these teeth? Are they viable? What's the lifespan of them? Should I design for future uh, abutments to be used. And the patient compliance is a big one. Maybe I should put that at the top. 
what can the patient accept here? Now, as the dental technician, a third party, I don't know. Hopefully the dentist is doing their due diligence up front, dictating a treatment plan that'll be uh, accepted by the client. Is the patient compliance, is their expectation gonna meet what they're gonna get? You know, some people uh, I've talked to, they said, they gave me this, I came in for a second consult. I was at the dental office or dentures down the street and they gave me this. Yeah, that's that's correct. It's a partial denture. Looks good. It's good. Yeah, but I got to take this out every night. Uh, they didn't tell you you needed to take the denture out every night. That's important information for the patient. So somewhere in the consultation stage, something was missed. Now, hopefully a lot of you are smiling out there and giggling because you've seen all this and heard all this and I've lived this and I'm not slagging on my competition or colleagues or workmates, but sometimes we just chair side manner got missed or we missed the, the consultation stage because the consultation stage is hard, especially when we're dealing with the geriatric population now, right? They've undergone tooth loss. They've undergone trauma. They've got declining cognitive skills. They've got the cognitive decline their level of understanding or their hearing or their vision is compromised. Their level of understanding might be compromised. Maybe it's starting to become compromised. Maybe it always was. Regardless, the consultation, patient compliance, I got to put that in there. Patient compliance. If they're not ready to, to accept, you've got, I don't care how great the, the dental technology is or the denturism is, if they're not ready to receive, then it's going to be difficult. Can be very difficult. So, digress on the client again. So, back to the same case. I use a stone model. I forget the bubbles here, okay? But uh, I'm doing the analyzing again, analyzing soft tissue. I'm giving a secondary design idea here. 0.25 undercut gauge on the four and on the seven. And here I'm going to do a different design, a little over the top for four anterior missing teeth. But Academically, technically, it makes more sense to minimize the rotation. Because sometimes in the class four, with these two embrasure classes, like the previous design, there's a fulcrum line that it should not exist, but it does between five and six across. And we've got this anterior movement. The patient's front four teeth are falling down or causing denture sores. It's, it's moving. We've got to minimize it. So here's design number two, mesial four. I'm not suggesting you do this, but I'm suggesting you think about this. And the distal of seven. So now I've taken my embrasure class and I've separated to four, uh, the to two acres class. My embrasure class now is two acres class assigned. Same depth, same red pencil, same drawing. And this is uh, could be a diagnostic model, obviously, or final impression. It's got bubbles, so I'd say diagnostic model. Uh, just for education purposes, let's say today. And I've split my embrasure class apart. So now instead of having two rest seats, I've got four. Basically like the four-legged chair. If we look at this occlusally, would be like a uh, trapezoid. So I've got my one here, I've got my one here, I got my one here, I gotta shrink my own picture down, it doesn't get out of the way. Sorry, my screen's a little different than yours, but I'm behind there is another rest point. And now we've got, uh, you know, conversely, we had the, the original design, we had the, the two, uh, here we've got the four rest points. And then if we talk about partial denture statics, we've got this, you know, four rest points, wider spot, more surface area, minimizing the rotation. Will the patient comply with clasps back in the seven, up on the four, closer to the aesthetic zone? I'm not sure. But this design is going to give us more stability, minimize the rotation. Uh, here is a diagnostic model where a lot of dentists, when they give me the diagnostic model, I'll do the preparation, the rest preparation, but it'll also include this interproximal channel, which seems to be forgotten. It's a little obtrusive though, because you're obliterating uh, the marginal ridge of the five, of the four, the first bicuspid here. And it's difficult, uh, I, 
can only assume uh, sitting chair side a few times is difficult patient in the supine position to prep here without disturbing uh, the second bicuspid. Uh, and that's why it's easier for the dentist to say, I'll take both marginal ridges out here and do my embrasure class on five and six. And here I prepped uh, number seven. So preparations important. Again, outline the dentalist area number one, the direct retainers number two, any auxiliary rests number three, I put up on the canines or minor connectors, and step number four would be the major connector. So is my step number four going to be the horseshoe? Or if there's a lot of rotation with the anterior posterior palatal strap, be more effective? I'm not sure, but I hate to do one and then think the other one would have been better. This is a lot of hardware. Again, the patient lost four front teeth. They didn't lose their palate. And now we're putting all this hardware back there and you know it's going to cause a lot of kinetic issues uh, right away off the bat, if, especially if they haven't worn an appliance before. We've got phonetic things to deal with. You know, their S's uh, and their, 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 their enunciation of words is altered. And again, if you go to the cognitive declined client, it's even so. Um, again, no solutions for you here today. <laughs> okay, a few, but some things to think about to give us different ideas. Not that I would do the first one, not that I do the second one, but they're going to go through my mind. They're going to go through my mind. I look at the tissue, I look at the teeth, and it doesn't take long. Today, I'm taking an hour of our time. This would take two minutes on the lamp bench, two minutes, I would think. And then with the patient is the heavy consultation, you know, uh, stage. Uh, maybe this is a good time to talk about uh, the economic viability of both jobs. You're saying, well, I wish I was a dentist, I get to see that. Or I wish I was a technician, I'd see more of it. Or if I wish I was a denturist, then I would be more in control of my schedule better in the earnings department on my uh, on my uh, 401k is going to grow, my T4 RSP or whatever you want to call it here in Canada. But it, it doesn't matter, I think, because the end goal is the same. The time is the same. As a technician, I could do more lab work because there's no consultation stage. As a denturist, there's a lot of consultation, which would take away time that I could be productive in the lab bench creating more appliances. Sure, the fee structure is different, but I think it's all relative if we're doing our due diligence in our consultation stage as teachers, which I'm sure most of us are. Um, I know in my own neighborhood, I hear nothing but good things of the neighboring uh, dentures uh, around in my neighborhood. So here's some contributing factors. Um, that contribute to the class four rotations. The length of the clinical crown, meaning the throw of the class, but they're very short crowns. I got short guide planes, and have short retention. The depth of the palate, I need to cross the parallel, or I need to cross the flat part of the palate at the midline, uh, parallel to the occlusion for more stability. I can't have my palate up on a hill or on the incline of the palate causing, you know, to slide down. Length of the guide plates, the long canines are short. The soft tissue undercuts at the front. We can engage here a little bit, but we can't engage too much. The class of occlusion, is it a lot of overbite? That's going to create this anterior inequity. The depth of undercuts of the abutments. How deep are the undercuts of the abutments that I can utilize? Am I going to use the embrasure class? If I have a rotation, it's not a good idea. Moving indentures is not good. Moving on soft tissues is not good. Moving on soft tissues of the geriatric is not good. Moving on tissues that, you know, they've already have decreased saliva flow from, uh, you know, the list of medications they may be on. Um, and now we've, we've lost the saliva that would be really important to kind of protect the tissues. And now we're kind of abrading them with, with acrylic. So these are things to think about, and these factors contribute to the class four rotation. I'd be lying to you if I told you, oh, I didn't make one in this part. Wish I did it again. Sometimes I've had to do it again, not often, thankfully. But 
I want to talk about now number two. So I hope I didn't put you to sleep with them. What? Number two is the large anterior space. Here, a rotation exists. Technically, according to even from the 1928 Kennedy textbook to today, this is technically a class three because it's involving some posterior teeth. But when you have a large anterior space, definitely a rotation is going to happen. Definitely a fulcrum line will exist. And I've seen this in the marketplace designed incorrectly, or I've had to correct it, or I've seen repairs come in, and I'll show you a few quickly here. And I go, wow, look at that. So I'll take my surveyor. I'm going to analyze the guide plane in the aesthetic zone, the mesial of six, try to go along a little uh, quicker. Is there a clock in here? Do you have a time? I, I took mine down. Uh, we're at there you go. Uh, five till the hour. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks, Jim. Should have asked you there. Colleague here. Um, so, the distal of the second molar and the knees. So, I'm, I'm checking all the undercuts. Which teeth am I going to utilize? I only have six teeth. We're not going to undergo extractions and implants and all on four and six and all this. It's a cast partial denture, maybe an acrylic transitional partial denture if these crowns are not in best condition. I've even and I do here. I tripoded the model on the base here. So I'm going to send it to the casting laboratory. And the height of contour of the anterior uh, mod modification, the height of contour of the tissue uh, for flat, uh, flange design. Uh, here, when this rotation exists, I've got my two five millimeter undercut on all the teeth I'm checking, one through seven. I'm trying to get an occlusal view of this model. Here I've marked the depth of the undercut, the depth of the undercut, 0.25 again on my embrasure class. I only have two teeth on this side. But maybe when I get to this occlusal viewer, I'll do it on paper shortly. But we need to talk about how much, uh, 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 excuse me, we need to talk about the fulcrum line that's going to exist here. And it's not like class one where it's the posterior, it's in the anterior section. There's the fulcrum line. Here's my acres class design, my reciprocal design. I'm doing four and seven, and here's my final uh, design. Now, if you look at the picture I sent you earlier, or I showed you earlier with the ledges of the two molars, there is a uh, demarcation of the tissue. I think this is more prudent. And the fulcrum line would exist here, and it's kind of reverse class one, where the indirect retainer now is back here. The post palatal strap of this anterior posterior strap or closed oval major connector, whatever term you want to use, this is the indirect retainer. This would be iatrogenic for the client, this kind of horseshoe design when there's a rotation. We've lost stability here at all. There's still going to be rotation with this. Another important fact that we've got this class going this direction, this one in this direction, and the seven back in that direction. We've got the two sevens, just like the one, but this is a lower. Gonna survey the teeth. This one here, I'm gonna go really quickly. Well, where I've seen this gone wrong is I always see models come in from the dental office where the undercut is at the distal of the tooth. They're using acres traditionally to the distal, like the model I showed you earlier with the two molars, the crowns, where the rests are on the mesial, the clasps are going distal. This type of case, because there's a rotation that's existing in this huge anterior space, the clasp must go distal to mesial. A lot of us probably already know that, but the clasp must engage either mesial lingual or mesial buck. It must engage. Okay, this is a little over the top. We don't need the major connector, but the clasp must go in this direction. When the when the denture wants to lift in the anterior section. I want the clasp to rotate in the undercut. I don't want the clasp to rotate, blow out, rotate into the tissue if it was going from distal, from mesial to distal. Here is a picture right out of Marx's textbook saying this is the issue when you have this clasp of these two molars that when this uh, wants to lift in the anterior, this clasp becomes really useless. It's just rotating further into the undercut, which is not retentive. We need to go in the reverse direction and try to engage here on the mesial. This is the example I'm talking about. 
mesh retention here, all acrylic major connector, but these clasps are going in the wrong direction. This is the model I showed you earlier with the different ledges. I can see the mesial rest, see the major connector. This seems a little bit troublesome to me. And if it wasn't troublesome, then this patient wouldn't be going to the dental office for a new ditch if they were okay. I mean, this class has to go in this direction and maybe the major connector, you know, something like this. Sorry, I drew over myself, but some, maybe full palette, maybe acrylic. But if it is gonna be in the Chrome department, we need to have something posterior. And then consultation is gonna to have to exist with the client with this uh, palatal strap further back than they're used to. Here's an all acrylic partial denture comes through the laboratory and the clasps are broken. Well, the clasps are broken because this big anterior space is dropping and the clasps just get tightened. They may go to the dentist regularly, get them tightened. Maybe they tighten them themselves and then uh, please replace here and here. Actually, you should replace it this way from distance to mesia with help. And here we have the correct, again, to hammer home that point in this direction. So here we have this long anterior dentition of the space. And one thing I showed you this picture is now occlusion has to come into mind. You cannot have the canine guided occlusion on the one canine on that uh, bicuspid, the prosthetic one. This has to be a group function, like full denture occlusion, where we have balanced occlusion, or we have group function in lateral excursions, protrusively, left laterally, and right laterally. And here it is in the patients where I've done the repair, and now I've adjusted the canine. So this canine here uh, was repaired because it popped off because of the patient who was in a canine guided occlusion like they are on this side. So I reduced this one here. They could go to the left regardless of aesthetics or not. This is about group function. And here now I've got them to move over. This is not eccentric, please. Now, the final thing of today is the patiency. So what did I do in practice? Something that you can take away if you didn't already that we could use uh, or that I've done, this was three weeks ago. Uh, the patient comes into the uh, office and I haven't had this maybe a couple of times. And, uh, well, first of all, in this picture, this is a denture that I had done two years prior to today. And the existing denture, she came in two years prior saying, I want a new one. And she pulled out of her purse, a crumpled piece of paper. And she says, uh, the mold is VitaPen T76, shade A2. And I'm like, who knows the mold and shade of their prosthetic teeth? So I'm not gonna deep part. I ask who the dentist is or who the dentist is. She tells me everything. They did a great job, but they're retired. They're not there anymore. I moved out to where you are. Could you make them? So I make this T76 uh, Vita Pan, it's their teeth. I thought it was a decent result. And the prosthetic teeth, if you don't know, because you could see my long acrylic, if I was to do it again, unless it's staining, a bit of both. Uh, the laterals and the centrals. She's missing four of her anterior teeth. The midlines don't match up, but the upper matches the, her face. The lower midlines have moved over, in case you're thinking that. But her main complaint was she was probably, I love the dent she made. Problem, when I put on my pink lipstick, they look a little dark. Like, really? They look fantastic. They do. Matches everything you have. Uh, I would like a little bit lighter. What can we do? Nothing wrong with the denture. Moves, stable, she likes it, she smiles. But the pink lipstick is the problem. Probably would have been more cost effective for her to change the color of her lipstick, but she wanted to have an additional denture in her in her in her repertoire or in her, her bathroom that she could put on. I said, no problem, let's try something different. So uh, this is the pictures of the old one that she presented with. And here's the denture that I made. I made the chrome framework. Put the T76, the Vita Pen, look pretty good. Uh, I just made a simple internal, external finishing line, I apron the canines. I didn't depart too much from what she had because she seemed pretty specific. I thought the result was okay here, but I move on. So I took a new final impression. Did I make a custom tray and PVS or polyether? No, I took a decent ounce of it with no bubbles. It's fine with me. I poured the model up 
in some dye stone and dental stone mixed together, trying to go a little bit rather than the soft dental stone or hydrocal. And I was thinking when I'm pouring the model, I'm looking at the tissue. I think, does she need the tissue treated? You see the hyperplastic tissue or denture stomatitis on the left or even in the bottom picture. These are stock photos. These are not mine. Uh, but I just took some hyperplastic pictures. And like, sometimes the patients are wearing the dentures 24 hours, 24 seven acrylic parcels. And now the tissue is responding negative. And dental technicians, maybe you've had this happen to you in the laboratory where you remade the case because the dentist said, doesn't fit. Fits perfect on the model, but the model doesn't bounce on the submucosa on the tissue that's edematous from the denture stomatitis. We didn't see that. You gotta read the model. Her tissue is a little bit beat up slightly, but she doesn't want to take a month out of wearing nothing to get her tissues back to good health. Or maybe if it's way out of whack, have something surgerized. But I'm thinking of this. So I take the model, I survey it just like I did. Uh, this was four weeks ago. My blue pencil kind of bled a little bit. I've got some bubbles that I've extracted off the guide plane since when I just said I had no bubbles in my final impression, but it looks like I had a couple of voids there. But it's real. I don't want to like pull any punches and say, oh, look at this beautiful case. I want to take away, I want you to take away because I've been to other courses and I go to a course, I'm like, that doesn't work in my hands. I remember once in my dental journey, I wanted to venture into denture staining. I tried, it just didn't look good. I looked at their stock photos. Come, theirs looks so good and mine looks so bad. Am I a lousy dental technician? I followed their instructions. I did sprinkle it, I did the composite. And then finally, from a lot of practice, it came and went, okay, now it's starting to look like those photos. But I want you to take away something today that you don't have to invest $100,000 in your clinic or laboratory. You can start this today. You can just use the surveyor you had at school. You can you, you use a blue pencil, which I'm sure you have, and start designing your stuff here. This was mine. I did a diagnostic setup. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't know which teeth I was going to use. I knew I was going to go to like a little bit higher end tooth than the A1. I was going to use the VitaPan XL or the VitaPan Plus. But here I had some MFTs, which are entry-level teeth, which I think are excellent, especially in the dental laboratory when you're trying to be, let's say, more cost-effective. These are fantastic. The mold size is very similar to the ones I'm going to use. So I did a diagnostic setup so I could see where the post position is going to be because I'm going to use a higher value tooth with the, with the glass in it. And I want to maximize my retention. I don't want anything left to, uh, uh, to question. So I did my block out. Uh, approximate for the tooth here. I did my uh, horizontal shoe extensions which you can see here, it's my pen still working here. I got a little horizontal shoe extension where I've exposed some tissue, not just the school one, the square. I did the whole way across. So I'm gonna have metal denture base now, mesial to the canines. It's gonna maintain the integrity of this guide plane, not only the width, but the length. So my acrylic finishing underneath, is gonna be nice and clean. It's not gonna feather edge and kind of flake, you know, where the acrylic meets the guide plane. Um, and I've gone ahead with my wax up. Again, you might be saying, okay, what kind of guy is gonna wax up his own? This is only 15 minutes if you have a lot of practice. I'm not using inlay wax, I'm using the patterns. I'm using the pattern wax to wax up my partial. I've got my MFT teeth in there that are gonna approximate the location of the teeth. There's only so much neutral zone. I can't go way over here. Can't go way out here for like, you know, labial lip support. It's important though you would use the putty index dental technicians, putty index if you're going to send it out because it's easily scalpeled or surgerized because now the technician or the chrome techs got to fit this putty index to a refractory model, which has block out on it. Might not fit like on your master model. So they need to surgerize the putty a lot easier than stone. A little small little tip there, use the putty if you're going to send out a matrix or an index for this post position. There's the finished wax up. Didn't fall in love with it too much, but I changed my external finishing line, moved the internal finishing line, offset, shoe extensions, trying to do something different. The tissue is a little bit beat up, so I came a little bit longer, consulted with the client that the major connector is going to be longer. I want to sit on a different finishing line because the uh, demarcation line of the old one 
to kind of, uh, you know, in, in heating on the soft tissue. And then the chrome framework was done. It goes for a try-in. Oh, I got another chrome framework here. That's what I want to put in here. So this is uh, four days ago. Another chrome work frame. It looks big. But what I wanted to show here is chrome technicians, this is 10 grams. That's probably the maximum weight I would use in making a partial denture. This is a very big one, too. You can see this closed oval anterior space, class two, unilateral free end. Uh, there's only five teeth left, but it's only 10 grams, 0. 0.0. This is a decimal scale. It's 10. Back to our patient C case. We retrofit the uh, case here. And now I've decided to opaque the framework. That's something very simple we can do. We have light cure in our laboratories and in our clinics. So I light cured the opaque on the labial, pink on the lingual. Uh, and what I'm trying to do here is because I know I'm going to have to really reduce the prosthetic teeth. And the last thing I want to do is increase the value of the teeth and go more, let's say, on the gray side. I don't want my A1 to go into C1, C2. I want my A1 to stay A1, okay? As close as possible. So here I opaque both. Silly, but why not? White on the outside, pink on the inside. And now I have both teeth in my clinic. I said, am I going to use the XL or the plus? These teeth, correct me, Jim, if I'm wrong, 12 to 18%. SiO2 or, or, or glass composite. The texture facial surface of these teeth are different than your entry level teeth. The layering is a little more intricate than your entry level teeth. The whole texturing I find is a lot better once it's washed with some of the saliva, hopefully not her pink lipstick, with the saliva, then I'm gonna get a better refraction of light so it doesn't look and just get absorbed in. It's gonna bounce off and give it some more vitality and more lifelike appearance. So I went with the Excel, thinking that the mesentery of the tooth was a little bit thicker, that I'm not going to get too translucent, and I'm going to be able to control that value a little bit better, or I don't want to increase the value at all. The mold is the same, T46 on both. Uh, both excellent. Uh, and I would have been interested to see what the other one would look like, but I chose the Excel. I didn't go do both. And then I did my wax try. Now you can see my labial flange is shortened. I didn't go into the labial sulcus. I can't, there's too much undercut, right? And she still has a lot of bone support there. Uh, and then I modified maybe the incisal edges a little bit. Um, I know that this was, her canines are on this kind of angle. And I didn't want to do the same angle on the lateral. So I think I had to kind of shave this lateral off. You do some incisal contouring. Wax is a little sloppy here on the close-up. Looks good from far. I put these on and I'm like, oh, could be a little bit neater. And then now I crop this picture as you would dental technician, put your thumb over that top because this is what you're going to see. This is the smile line. This is the window. I got her giggling and this is as much as you can see. And now I'm concentrating. I'm concentrating from here down on my value. And naturally, the gradient of the teeth of the XL going to get slightly more translucent. You can see the light even off my camera reflect, uh, refracting in different directions. And in you porcelain buildup guys know what I'm talking about. Now, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. The patient has to accept this. Sometimes I do some stuff that I'm thinking, it's okay. It's not great. But the patient's ecstatic. So they're happy. I'm happy. I did the best I could is all I is all my, my main goal is to do the best I can. Incisal edge now of these XL teeth. I'm gonna go and maybe contour them. I'm gonna give them a little bit more of a ledge. Uh, incisal edge, a little bit more attrition to match the lowers. It's canine guided occlusion, so I'm gonna disclude and protrusive movements. I'm gonna leave a slight diastema on the central to match the diastema on the lower, which we'll see when the case is done. And here's the wax tooth triad. You know, she reached for the lipstick. She put it on. She goes, well, hang on a second. I'm like, yes, I've got to put the lipstick on. Now I'm going to try them on. So this denture now is missing these four teeth and this uh, number five here, which was a uh, lingual form, A1, um, that I had off another card and I put in. 
Uh, I didn't put the physiodins in, I put the lingua form, and I had many of them left over to put that by cuspid instead of the aesthetic sum. Again, here in the try-in, I talked about this, I leveled it off. I may have done some contouring, I maybe opened this up a little bit. And you can see the diastema, she's on the lower, and she definitely needs to go for a cleaning, not lipstick. She needs to get a little skin. And here's the insertion of the completed denture. Uh, and there she is completed. If I did it again, would I do it differently? Yeah. I'd have to cut back my interdental uh, pills. Anyways, thanks for your time. But before you go, and Jim, before you come back on, I want to go uh, uh, just to uh, quickly recap uh, with the document camera, if I can. Hopefully, everybody's got this here. And maybe a little takeaway uh, from these uh, uh, diagrams here. So, this was our Kennedy class four uh, today. And this is going to take a bit of a recap. I'm going to outline my intention scenario. Whether you leave the assessment pill, probably we leave it exposed. How am I going to attach these pieces to the technician and the denture, sending these out to the laboratory, or maybe to the dentist? For reductions, you want to show your best foot forward in your drawing. If it's going back to the lab, uh, to dentist in your team for diagnostic purposes, give them the drawing. It's not a big deal. I'm sure you all have this drawing on your prescription. Um, that's the first step. Step two is Paul. Yes. Paul, as you as you draw, um, kind of turn your head a little bit more towards the mic so that it, it otherwise it becomes muffled. Okay. Can you hear me better now? Uh, just a little bit. I'm sorry. I guess my must be using the microphone from the, uh, from the, are you okay now? Um, yeah, you can still kind of need to move. So your voice goes more towards the, the mic as you're doing this. How about this way? That works, uh, but <laughs> hard for you to draw that way though. <laughs> no, I can. Talented, talented. Okay, so it's going to be quick. So uh, if you can't hear me, you can see what I'm doing. Hopefully, you can hear me muffled a little bit. I apologize. I'm using two microphones. Technologies, I don't think it's ever going to catch on. Funny stuff. So outline the dentalist area. Decide on my direct retainers number two. And then my first drawing, I was doing the embrasure clasps. So that's step two. And try to be neat. I'm going to be quick here. Step three, any indirect retainers or additional rests, whether they're mesiolingual rests, cingulum rests, or aprons, you decide. Step four is the major connector. Is it going to be a horseshoe? Is it going to be a closed oval? Is it going to be anterior posterior strap? You decide. Is it going to be metal backings? Is there going to be posts on top of the mesh? Is it going to be metal denture base? All these factors you're going to consider. Now, this is one dentogram. Uh, I've got the uh, the other one I want to review quickly. And I apologize if I go over time just really quickly here. And this one I want to hammer home that this, I think, is more prudent to go in this direction. I put an arrow. Whether I do it in red would be more considerable. But it goes from distal to mesial. So when we have this... Uh, big, large modification wanting to lift, then these clasps will rotate into the undercut. If the clasps are going this way, they'll just rotate deeper into the undercut. So those two things you want to take away. If you want to look at all of these design, you can go to my YouTube page, uh, I'll look under Paul Carolitis. I think I got class one, two, three, four, and I go through them all and I posted them there for students long ago. But if you're interested, you can do that. Uh, let me see if I can get back to my presentation. Are we okay, um, uh, Jim? I think that's going to wrap it up for me. I want to thank you for your time today, everybody. Um, I hope I didn't speak too quickly or too uh, uh, briefly. I tried to cover some uh, main points, and hopefully you can take one or two things away back to your labs and, and clinics. And, uh, I hope to see you live one time. All right. Well, thank you, Paul. Uh, let me... Uh... Let me finish up a few things here. Uh, great information. Um, we'll get to the Q and A in just a moment. Uh, CE, you'll receive a uh, an email through our education marketing department about the CE. 
The webinar, today's webinar has been recorded. You'll find that it's posted. Give us a couple days on our Vita YouTube channel as well. Uh, and then here is uh, some support from the home office if you need it uh, for the help desk. And then we have um, some uh, outside reps, Canada and or the US. So if you need to get a hold of your local rep for any questions, uh, please uh, give them a phone call. And then we have additional webinars down the, the line. Uh, we'll probably for certain have a couple more with uh, Paul if he's available. Uh, but we also have uh, throughout the year, this is just a partial list of the dates, various uh, denture, removables, fixed, and so forth uh, that are coming down the, uh, the year. Hope you can join us. Here is Paul's uh, information. So Paul's been gracious enough to let us um, display this information. If you need to follow up, if you need to get a hold of Paul, please do so. Uh, here is his um, contact information, of course. So please do that uh, if you can. And then we're just going to go into some Q&A information. So uh, Paul, yes. uh, let's look at the questions we have. And let me just double check, see if there's any others on the question box. All right, so um, let's see if this is, actually has a question to it. Uh, it's flattery, you are, um, you're, you're their favorite by Rebecca, you're a gifted teacher. Um, no okay. time too long that I've enjoyed a webinar. Uh, please, uh, let's see, actually apply. They're, they're gracious. They, they like that you've actually uh, taught them information that they can actually apply in, in the practical world. Cool. Uh, we can actually apply also. Okay. So uh, let's go from there to... Any questions here? You got a lot of flattery I'll questions for sure. Stick with the flattery, I love that. That's gonna get it. I love that stuff. Holy, I don't think my head's gonna fit in the picture anymore, will it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's getting bigger, but that's okay. We that's we have right. a big screen. That's right. This way so, is too big. Uh, gonna get really small. <laughs> So as far as uh, questions go, uh, one is, have you started to do any printing digital parcel dentures? In personally, uh, personally in the marketplace, uh, no, but I'm lucky enough and privileged enough to be here at uh, George Brown College, which we have printed here. Uh, and I'll be straight up, I haven't inserted any of those printed frameworks, but I've fabricated the printed frameworks. So I'd like to say we're still on the research side of things, me personally. Um, probably because of my age, I was kind of late to the digital party, but uh, I've got a great colleague here, uh, Carrie Kodire, and myself, we run the Partial Denture de Department program in dental technology, and we've embarked on it the last couple of years. And we're doing that here presently at the school. Um, and then COVID kind of put a wrench in stuff, as you know, like everything. But uh, hopefully I'll be inserting some of these uh, digitally printed ones or or uh, whether they're printed or printed in cast. And in, in hopefully one day, uh, very soon, I'll insert them in the patient's mouth. All right. That, that's good. We look forward to uh, seeing what the, uh, what the results are and maybe have you come back and, and talk about that when you can. Yeah, it'd be awesome. Uh, so on your, you, you talked about the uh, tissue support, uh, the anterior support, the partial denture. Uh, if you have to do like a, a butt uh, type uh, flange, you know, you remove that flange and you're just Correct. kind of beaded around the cervical of those teeth. Does that Correct. compromise the support? Of your I, definitely think that, I definitely think you're lacking potential of retention for you're increasing the possibility of rotation. I'm not saying it will because you've also got guide planes and you've got the clasps, but you're missing one component. But from an aesthetic point of view, if you're going to do that, 
I mean, in the earlier days, we would take a denture stock tooth and add the tooth colored acrylic where we over trimmed it or we were short. But if you're going to use a high uh, quality tooth like the ones in the presentation, then you best be trimming perfectly to the tissue bin. I don't want to start adding uh, substandard composite to the gingival margin or it's approximately little as possible. I'd like to maintain the prosthetic tooth as much as possible. That answers that question. Well, on, on that anterior flange, is there a certain um, length that you go into the undercut on that labial? Yeah, good question. That's a good question, tell them. <laughs> uh, obviously, from a denturist point of view, I'm going to leave it a little bit longer and tighter because I can control the adjustment chair side. From a dental technician's point of view, I'll probably err on the shorter side, giving the dentist less adjustments, but not zero. And I guess that comes from just looking at experience with the case and trimming it. Probably been wrong a couple of times where I've had to reduce more, but I'm going to try to engage as much as I can. There's nothing wrong with it. But if it's mobile, if it's rotational, then the patient's going to have an adverse reaction. So that, that's a good question. So this is, um, what do you, it, I think it deals with the uh, alloy you're using, but what do you cast uh, your RPDs with and then a follow-up? Right. Have you have any so, experience with titanium? I haven't done a titanium one a long time ago and I had to send it out because I never had the, uh, the privilege of working with that machinery to cast it. But the one I'm using in the picture today, to keep it a little bit lighter, I'm going to use the extra hard. And uh, I guess I can plug Bagel's extra hard uh, chromium cobalt alloy. They have four or five, I'm sure, at least four. And I'll use the extra hard so I can go a little bit uh, thinner in my wax up uh, without compromising the, the flexural strength and the weight. Uh, the, the, uh, it depends on the design too. I've seen some palettes, if you go more Euro uh, or even Far East, I've seen the palette, they'll make narrower bars, but a little bit higher for strength. Uh, and then that becomes almost like a speed bump for speech and the deglutition of food and an obstruction to the tongue. Can the patient get used to it? Sure, they get used to a lot of stuff. But you want the patient to ease into uh, acceptance faster. So I'd like to keep tighter to the palate, as tight as possible. I would even invest under pressure, under bar, which in my earlier days, we never did that. You're just doing those extra small little steps to increase the quality of the prosthetic without increasing time and something you could put into the everyday practice. So the refractory models are under bar, the investment rings are under bar, under pressure, and then therefore the, the, the duplicates are um, a high shore of silicone, not using hydrocolloid. I mean, in the laboratory setting, you may have to go into the hydrocolloids to keep the cost effectiveness down. So a long answer there, but uh, long story short, extra hard. Titanium, unfortunately, no, not enough experience, except that it's a lot lighter and a lot stronger. All right. Uh, on your occlusal rest and your channels, do you have your dentist or yourself, if you're doing it, uh, do, you, do you have the dentist uh, adjust that occlusion where the, par the, the, the partial's going on that arch? Or do you have them also adjust the opposing? Sometimes both. I will give them the choice. I say it's in the notes. So when I give them the diagnostic model, I'm giving them the, the maximum reduction or what I think would be possible. But many times they can't. So they're going to go into the opposing. Many times it might even be a crown. They're not going to start cutting into the porcelain. They're going the opposing. Many times we'll have to alter the design because you can't go there. So I hope that answers that question. But yeah, what, what, what's your, uh, what's the thickness you, you, of those um, uh, rests and channels? What's the thickness you try to achieve? Uh, you know what? That's a good question. I've never measured them because I'm always assuming the dentist is going to err on the lighter side because they're into tooth structure. It's not so evasive like the early days of equipoise design where you'd obliterate the contact and you would have metal interproximally all the way down for your equipoise class but uh the patient's not gonna and even if i was the client i wouldn't want that much tooth reduction so minimum is possible but to measure it i apologize i don't have a measure 
uh, as you well, can see right. in this presentation, you can look at the, what I've done on the diagnostic model. Because I would never take a depth gauge that way. I'm just doing it occlusal. That's another good question. Naturally too thin, your class is going to break. And we all, all have right. That. Yeah. Thank you for your question. All right. So um, uh, this one is uh, if you find the patient doesn't care for the um, Oh, the, the tooth texture, that's what they're talking about. All right, so if you find that the, uh, you set the teeth, you try it in, the patient goes, hey, I think there's a little too much texture to it. Um, do you go to a different tooth line or do you just simply polish off some of the texture? I'll be honest, I'm just polish it off. Because I've had that, yeah. so that's a very good question. I've had some patients, and then usually I won't do it right away because they'll go with their tongue and they go, this feels really strange on my lip and on my tongue because the tongue is a big perceptor. It's going immediately to what's new in there. Saliva is, you know, starting fast, and they're just nonstop, uh, you know, uh, going there. And then they'll say, "I feel all these bumps." I said, "Well, let's see after." So I'm going to give them a week before I'm going to go polish it right away. I hate to be a knee-jerk reaction to the patient as long as it's nothing that's putting the patient at harm. I think they can wait a week, and then. 50% of the time, if I was to take a, an average, I would probably reduce it. And then what they don't know is I'm going to reduce it only slightly because then they have a perception problem too. They'll say, oh, that feels better. And little do they know I took off next to nothing. All right. So, so um, that's between you and the client. Yeah. Okay. But I'm not going to uh, change so it. It's too painstakingly to get them in. Yeah, I would imagine. And there's a lot of structure that you can go there. You're not going to compromise the shape by taking uh, some of your uh, developmental grooves off the facial surface. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, so this uh, person makes a lot of acrylic parcels nice. in, compared to cast frames. And all of the appliances rest on the tissue. Uh, the question is, I feel like maybe I could design a class to set on the occlusal rest for a better partial. Uh, I'm not sure if that is a clear idea, good idea or not. So not they sure. want more vertical support for their acrylic partials. So are they using like a wrought preformed clasp with the rest or something like that? Yeah, it doesn't say, but let's assume they are. Well, I think that's the biggest difference between an acrylic partial and a cast partial because the cast partial is going to have vertical support, so it's not going to displace vertically into the tissue over time. And you see with acrylic partials over time, if this is my anterior four, and then six years from now, the teeth are now a millimeter and a half shorter. They've gone into the submucosa. Right? I would say, and without the risk of sounding really cavalier, that the acrylic partial denture should be transitionally in nature. That it should be used in transition, transition to implants or transition to the chromium cobalt. Unfortunately though, for cost reasons and many others, the acrylic partial is the definitive end game, right? I mean, we have had our own uh, Al McCormand here go down to uh, the Nine Miles of Smiles outreach program in uh, Jamaica every year prior to COVID. And they would do all acrylic partial dentures and the people are ecstatic with that, right? Did they not, would they be better suited with more support in a cast parcel possibly but it just wasn't in the cards for them, you know in the outreach program right and just getting something is better than nothing so to answer the question maybe i didn't I hope i didn't skirt it but if you no, wish you could use a raw vertical support why not if there's room in the occlusion do it uh another kind of design question um would you utilize a lingual apron in place of reciprocal arms? This is another good question. And I'm gonna answer it like I said I would at the beginning. It depends which tooth we're talking about. If you see in the design I did, I apron the anterior because of the vertical overlap. In the posterior, a lot of people apron the posterior because they're anticipating a tooth loss so they can serrate the apron to do a tooth addition. It depends on your 
let's say philosophy. I know in the earlier days, some schools would say, stay away. These are dental schools now. Their philosophy is stay away from all free gingival margins. Don't cover the free gingival margin. You're gonna be food compacting under there and you're gonna exacerbate the tooth health or periodontal ligaments even further from hygiene. Cause you're assuming they're, they're prefacing it that the hygiene of those clients is not great to begin with. So let's not apron it and now food compact and debris compact under there and obliterate the free gingival margin further. So, and then there's the other thought by saying, no, cover it all, and then we'll have less uh, obtrusion there, whether the tongue, food, debris, et cetera. So there's two rules of thought. Even here in Canada, I know I could see in the early days, if it was an apron design, I'm like, oh, the dentist from the University of Western. If it was a lingual bar design or minor connectors away from the pre-gingival margin, I'm saying, oh, that dentist from the University of Toronto, because they're just propagating their belief system. Now in my own belief system, I said it depends. If the tooth is compromised and the support is compromised, I'm going to apron. If it's not, then I'm going to stay away from the free gingival margins as much as I can. So I kind of answered it both ways. So I apologize, whoever was asked that question. It depends on which case we're talking about. Would I do it all the time? No. So if there is saying, would I do it all the time, apron? I say no. Do I see other people do it all the time? Yes. Why do they do it? It's easier to manufacture, there's less to polish, it's easier to wax up, it's easier to trim, and it's easier to do a tooth addition, and possibly easier for the patient to comply, because there's less areas of, let's say, open margins, or open attachments. So, long answer, sorry, Jim. No, it's okay. Um, it depends, right? So, um... Uh, kind of a follow-up, and then we'll wrap it up. Would sure. your apron, um, the teeth, all the teeth lingually, would you make your go lingual for your apron? I'm assuming so would, talking your, about would you apron all teeth future? lingually? No. No. I would if it's an acrylic partial to try to gain some vertical support and close off the free gingival margins and have some stability in the acrylic partial or the flipper, so to speak, something like that, uh, the transitional partial, but in chrome, no. But have I before? Yes, because there was some anticipation that there was gonna be some future tooth loss. But now you gotta ask yourself the question, if there's future tooth loss, why were you making a cast chromium cobalt anyways? Why wouldn't you do the transitional denture to begin? And then once the tooth loss has been encountered, then go to the cast. So to do it as a uh, car blanche, like on every case, the answer would be no, I would not. All right. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, any uh, last comment or, um, you know, you, uh, information you'd like to share before we leave, close this out? You know what? I had fun. I hope someone, I hope, People out there that attended today or watch it uh, uh, recorded can take a few things away from my cases or from some botched cases you saw that I presented there and maybe take away uh, enhancing the aesthetics up here in the anterior section. Hopefully you take that away. And I think we can just in the, you know, the patient is at the end of it all. At the end of the day, we can make the patient results better than we make our job better. and. It's just better all the way around. I mean, we just hate to go backwards all the time. Nobody takes criticism well, you know, the, as a dental technician or a denturist. We want to stay in a positive light. And we can take away hopefully a few small things today without spending, you know, uh, bazillions of dollars to invest in our clinics and labs to, to, to just create better prosthetics. And I think that's the goal. That's my goal. I'm still on my own journey and I'm still trying to get better myself. I would consider myself an average dental technician. Not below and not above. Just average on my average daily job and struggling to try to get better. You know, so that's the end. So I want to thank everybody. And Tim, thanks for having me on. And hopefully in the future, uh, come on again and we'll talk about another subject. I got lots to say. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much. I think you've shared a lot of good, um, useful information. 
uh, for everyone to consider and utilize uh, in their daily life. We definitely will have you come on it on again if uh, you're willing to, uh, to to go through it. Uh, appreciate your time and the audience. I appreciate you joining us today. Again, you can find the recording on the Vita North America YouTube channel and our social medias. Uh, I'd like to thank Paul again for joining us, taking the time out of his uh, busy schedule and day to uh, provide us with some excellent education. So thank you, Paul. And this will conclude today's webinar. Thank you for joining us.